So today I'm going to be giving about a 25 to 30 minute presentation on the state of health and wellness at our university. And then I'm going to be calling up Kathleen McCutcheon, who's going to talk for just a little bit, as well as Larry Llewellyn, and add their comments as well. And lastly, you have to be present because we have 17 prizes that we are going to be raffling off. So you want to stay till the very end so you can get your prizes. Well, how many of you have tried to change the behavior of somebody you love? I think we all have, right? Squeeze the toothpaste differently, put the toilet seat down, um, get active. We know that behavior change is not easy, right? I call it character building. It takes time, it takes inspiration, it takes support. And you might be saying, well, why would Ohio State want to make major commitment and investment into health and wellness? And I will tell you, first and foremost, it is because we care very much about the faculty, staff, and students who are here at this university. We also know that healthy, happy people are more engaged, they're more productive, they miss less work. So we want to do this to improve your health, your happiness, your family's health and happiness as well. Mostly people change when crisis happens. Uh, when, it, when your emotion is raised. And I won't get into a long story, but my reason to be healthy, to be active, is my family. Because when I was 15 years of age, my mother dropped dead right in front of me. She sneezed, burst an aneurysm, and died when I was home alone with her. And what was sad about her story, she had been having bad headaches for about a year. And my dad kept saying, well, you go to the doctor and get checked and find out what's wrong with you. Well, after she died, my dad was cleaning out her purse. And she had seen our family physician the week before got a prescription for a high blood pressure medication and never had it filled. So I tell people all the time, if you don't do this for yourself, make some healthy lifestyle changes, we want to do it for the people who love us, who want us to be around for a very, very long time. So today, I'm going to challenge each and every one of you to make just one, just one change. And maybe that change is 20 minutes a day, two 10-minute breaks to get up and to move. We're launching Wellness Wednesdays across the university today. So everybody who knows me is used to seeing me in suits. And I said, Wednesdays, let's get comfortable. Let's wear Buckeye gear so we can get more active. The latest research coming out shows that if we sit more than three hours a day, our cardiovascular risk really goes up. So we have instituted walking meetings, standing meetings. The beauty of a standing meeting, besides you burn more calories, your meetings are over a lot quicker. So that's a, that's a really, really good thing. So I want you to take our wellness quiz. One, protecting yourself and others from high stress is an important part of your leadership, those of you who are in leadership positions. Multitasking, true or false, is an acquired skill and is essential to success 
in today's complex work environment. Three, understanding why does one does something is a critical step in the process of personal change. True or false? Personal effectiveness requires a highly developed capacity for self-discipline and willpower. Well, how many of you answered false to all four of those particular items? So we had a handful of people who answered false. They are all false, all false. So wellness, we have to remember, is much more than physical health. Wellness involves so many dimensions, spiritual, emotional, financial, social. So when we think about activities to roll out on wellness across the university, we have to think along all of these particular wellness dimensions. Well, do you feel like that on some days? I'm sure you all do. The evidence tells us faculty, staff, and students are very stressed on a day-to-day -day basis. And what's really sad, we have an epidemic of depression and anxiety disorders right now. One out of four adults, as well as children, now have some type of mental health disorder, and less than 25% of people affected receive any treatment whatsoever at all. Well, we had to consider the current state of health when we were forming our strategic plan. If you ask somebody like Dr. Steve Pariser or Dr. Mike Caligari, who's in the audience today, what's the number one killer of Americans? They would probably tell me cardiovascular disease. And technically that is true. However, if you think about all morbidity and mortality, sincerely, it is behaviors. Behaviors are the number one killers of Americans that lead to cardiovascular disease, alcohol, substance use, everything we're seeing now, so much of it is linked to behaviors. Overweight and obesity will soon pass tobacco as the number one cause of preventable death and disease in the United States. What a change from 50, 60, 70 years ago. One out of two people also have a chronic disease. One out of four have multiple chronic diseases and most many people with chronic disease suffer from mental health issues such as depression or anxiety disorders. So, we have a wonderful preventive approach to wellness here, which is your plan for health. And I wanted to show you some of our latest data on where we are at, faculty and staff, with certain key outcome indicators. Well, all of you know it's important to get biometric screening so everybody can know their numbers and then put into place an action plan for what we're gonna do about that. Although we increased participation rate some from 2010 to 11, we still need to engage many more people in getting biometric screens. The PHA, you know, it is amazing because if you complete it, you get $360 back. And I was with a bunch of leaders on Monday in Chicago for a World Health and Wellness Congress. And I was talking to those corporations about how do they incentivize folks. When they heard we gave $360 to folks, 
they were like, wow, that's a big investment. Because many of them might give a hundred or so on. But I will tell you, folks that I have talked to across the university, the $360, which you think would be a great motivator, that isn't a motivator for some people. So we have to figure out what's going to motivate everybody to get more engaged with their health and wellness. 68% of our faculty and staff are overweight or obese. Now, that's pretty much so the national average, but a lot of people who I share this data with are very surprised at our university that we would mimic, in large extent, what the national numbers are. So I tell people we have a lot of room, a lot of opportunity that exists here to really make a difference. You can also see about 25% of our folks have elevated cholesterol levels, and a substantial number of people here, about half, do not have great levels of HDLs. That's the good type of cholesterol in our bodies. So one of the things that helps us to build higher HDL levels is movement, is physical activity, is exercise. And I think if we can just, again, get people standing more, walking more, Steve is going to stand. <laughs> He's so good. He's so good that we can get these up even more. Well, and look at our students because they have room for improvement as well. And we have awesome services in student life here. Counseling, Mickey is here. They do a great job with our students. But our students recognize that their elevated stress is very high. And students also recognize that stress interferes with their academic performance. We also know we've got a lot of studies that there is a relationship between wellness and how engaged people are, how productive they really are. So why are we investing so much of our effort, our resources in wellness? We're doing that first because we care about you and we care about your families. There is a return on investment though that we do see as a result of institutions investing in wellness. The return on investment is anywhere between four and six dollars for every single dollar that we invest in promoting the health and wellness of our faculty, staff, and students. Well, when I came and I started learning about what we do here in Buckeye Nation, I was really impressed because there have been multiple efforts going on across the university, as you can see from the slide. However, oftentimes we tend to get focused within our own unit. What we did was the leaders from these various, various units pulled together. So we're in the same boat and we're rowing on the same team so we can make an even bigger impact. So we caught a very big dream. Now, some people who are very skeptical would say, Bern, that's a ridiculous dream to be the healthiest university in the not only state, the nation, but in the globe. But that's our dream. And we are committed to persist through all the character builders until we achieve this particular dream. Because we do believe we've got the right team, the right time, the right place, the right faculty, staff, and students in place that we can see this come to fruition.
We've held innovation workouts. We've talked to people across the university saying, what else can we do to reach this particular very rigorous goal? And we now have a very exciting strategic plan for the next five years in terms of how we are gonna achieve this. We formed a one university health and wellness council that comprises leaders again from faculty, staff, students across the entire university. Our mission is to facilitate the highest levels of wellness for faculty, staff, students, as well as our community. We are very engaged in also promoting the health and wellness of our community as well as our state. Now, we also recognize that we can work with people on behavior change. In fact, we have wonderful health coaches that are in your plan for health that do health coaching with faculty and staff around certain wellness areas, and they do a great job. But we also recognize that we have to build a culture and a context of wellness at this university that makes it fun and easy for people to be well, to engage in wellness activities. Because without a culture and a context for wellness, our efforts might not sustain. And we want to see what we do sustain for many, many years to come. We want to ensure that all faculty, staff, and students have access and are engaged in the wellness activities that we offer. We have created a wellness calendar, Wellness Wednesday calendar for this year that contains activities, lunch and learns, all across the university, including the medical center. So that calendar will be housed online, and it would be great if all of you go back to your colleagues and say, check out what we're doing in terms of wellness here at the university, and let's get really a lot of momentum going around this. We're really into transdisciplinary collaboration that's super important. We want to continue to up our programming and education and skills building for our faculty, staff, and students. We're working on university frameworks to promote wellness, nutrition framework, a healthy office framework. We're into formal recognition of people's efforts. And everything we do, we want to do in an evidence-based way. We want to implement what works. We want to be innovative and try new things when we see areas that do not have good evidence behind it. And we want to launch new innovative and entrepreneurial initiatives that promote wellness. So under the One University Health and Wellness Council, we have created several sub-councils that will work with the One University Health and Wellness Council in specific areas. The Medical Center Sub-Council, and Larry and Steve lead that particular council. They have started meeting. Yesterday, I met with the University Health and Wellness Sub-Council for faculty and staff. We had at least 28 people on that sub-council from all across the university. But we'll have an outcome sub-council, a technology and innovation Subcouncil, of course, a student, one focus there, as well as a your plan for health subcouncil. But the beauty of this is they'll all be working in tandem with the One University Health and Wellness Council. So we reach the exciting goals that we have established for our university. 
I could stand up here for an hour and talk about all the exciting initiatives that you're going to see launched. Um, a couple months ago, probably six, seven months ago, we started onboarding a pilot program, faculty and staff in wellness. So shortly after they're employed at the university, they've been meeting with a nurse practitioner, a physician, talk about their PHA, gather more data, talk about an individualized plan. We're also going to be sponsoring a program, Wellness Mentors, we keep going back and forth about the name for this, but I will be putting out a call shortly to all the deans and VP units across the university, a call for three or four people from each of those colleges and units who wanna go through a wellness program and really be the wellness champions and mentors in their units, helping us to create a culture and context for wellness. So again, we have many initiatives that are occurring we started Buckeye Wellness Tips based on the best evidence. One of the things we are going to be raffling off is hot off the press, our Buckeye Wellness Packs. And this has 13 evidence-based items for health and wellness in them, explaining what they are. These have been such a big hit. We've been getting calls from people all across the university and community saying, do you have 200 of these that we can have for our employees and whatnot? So they're becoming very, very popular. We're hoping they're going to be as popular as the candy Buckeyes, but focused, <laughs> but focused on wellness. Now, one of the last things I'm going to cover is that we have developed, we just signed a collaboration with the Johnson & Johnson Corporation. They have a company out of Florida called the Human Performance Institute. 30 years ago, a psychologist by the name of Jim Lair started to work with NFL athletes and gold medalists on how to peak their performance, how to get more energy throughout the day, how to eat healthier, how to engage better. And they were so successful with that program that they actually developed another program called Corporate Athlete. So for the last 20 years, they have been putting corporate executives through this particular program. We have started putting faculty and staff through this two-day program. We now have about 19 trainers trained in this health athlete program. And everybody who volunteers for those wellness mentors we want to put through the program as well to help you again gain more skills in health nutrition and energy management well we have a human energy crisis going on right now how often do you walk down the hall in your office building and see people maybe looking like that dozing off in meetings it's hard to doze off if you have a walking or a standing meeting. So another reason to get people standing. I want you to answer this energy audit. One, what is the quantity of energy you have? What's the quality of your energy on a scale from one, meaning very little to four, meaning a lot? How about your focus, focus of your energy and the force of your energy? Well, if your score was 14 to 16, you are fully engaged. But what we want to do, because the majority of people are not fully engaged every day, we want to get them to the level of full engagement. So we're going to be offering this program more here at the university for people who really want to go through it. 
because most people don't manage their energy well. And then we get those sags all during mid-morning, mid-afternoon. Well, I want to show you a clip from the program, which is a wonderful clip about how important staying focused is to accomplishing goals and missions that you set for yourself. So Jim Lair did an experiment. He had four big NFL football players. And he said, what I want you to do is I want you to run a mile through the Florida woods and there's gonna be a white fence a, a mile into it. All you have to do for this mission, touch the white fence, turn around and run back. And these four big football players, they chuckled, they laughed. They said, all right, that, this is a piece of cake. And Jim said, now wait a minute, he said, there may be wild boars that you encounter through the woods. And they're like, yeah, right, ha, ha, ha. Well, watch what happens when they're near the wh white fence and Jim honks a wild boar sound. And I may need Eric for this, but. great example of when we let distractions get in our way of what we're really focused on. So what Jim did after that particular clip, he actually put four law enforcement officers through the same experiment. What those guys did when they got near the white fence and he honked the wild boar sound, they looked both ways. They didn't see any wild boars. They touched the white fence. They went back and completed the mission because they really knew how to manage their energy very well and how to stay focused on what they were doing. So lastly, managing energy not time is the key to extraordinary results. How many of you have taken lots of time management courses or a couple? Yeah, because we're always searching for how do we get more time? But it truly is energy. And if we manage our energy well, we'll be much more engaged, much more focused. So I believe, our team believes, that we're on our way to becoming the healthiest university on the globe. One thing I wanted to call to your attention is our university was the first university in the country to go through an accreditation process with U.S. Healthiest and Health Lead. Ten corporations have gone through it. We were the first university. And now we are going to collaborate with U.S. Healthiest to refine their accreditation program for other universities throughout the country. And that is really very exciting. We are also launching the first national summit on building healthy academic universities. That will take place April 22nd and 23rd. Letters have already gone out from Gordon Gee and myself to about 200 university presidents inviting them to join us in this effort of building healthier academic institutions. So we are gonna get there and the way we're gonna do it is with your help and our team, which is fabulous. And today, before you leave, I just want you to commit to making one healthy lifestyle change. It doesn't have to be the whole elephant. 
and you, you don't have to go from not getting much of any activity to five or six days a week. But what can you do when you go back to your units? 10 minute walk. Cut your one hour meetings down to 50 minutes and use 10 minutes for recovery. Take a walk around the unit or the block or whatever it is. But I encourage you to commit to making one healthy lifestyle change. Lastly, I had to show you this picture. So, you know, our president, who is terrific, he visits 44 counties every summer. He calls it his friend raising trips. And I will tell you, it's like the presidential campaign. It's unlike anything I've ever experienced. You show up in these little towns and people are dressed in Buckeye clothes with blow up Brutuses playing the fight song. It's fabulous. But here's a picture in Cincinnati and they have all these statues of pigs. What I didn't realize is Cincinnati was once the pork capital, right? But we were walking past and we said, oh my gosh, there's a healthy pig with fruits and vegetables all over him and he's got wings on him. Well, there's a lot of people again who will be skeptical, who are skeptical of our dream for becoming the healthiest university. But I say skeptics can say that will never happen. Buckeyes say that can happen. Pigs will fly here. So with that, I'm actually gonna call up uh, Dr. Megan Amaya, and she is our Director of Health Promotion. She works very closely with Kathleen, Larry, myself in really doing a lot of implementation work of the vision and the mission. So she's going to do two minutes of movement with us before you hear from Kathleen and Larry. All right. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I wish we had a little music, but we don't have any music. So we're going to start with some head rolls. So take your uh, ear to your, your shoulder and roll to the other side. Do not roll all the way back. Just go shoulder to shoulder. And just so you know, you're in good hands. I'm a certified personal trainer. You don't have anybody weird up here leading you through this. You're not going to get injured. So keep rolling. You want to be very careful. You don't want to go too far. You don't want any pain in here. All right, roll the shoulders back. Doesn't it feel good to get up, stretch out those abdominal muscles? Few things I'm gonna remind you of over the next minute and a half is keep your abdominal muscles engaged and tight. Even though we're rolling our shoulders, we wanna bring them down all the way. Keep our shoulders away from our ears. Now, it is tight in here, so do your best with this. I'm gonna turn sideways, you're gonna face forward, and I want you to squat. Small squats or deep squats into your chair. A couple of notes. You don't have to go very deep on this one. It can be a shallow. You want to sit back in your chair. Pretend you're, and women, we know how to do this, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting your glute muscle way back there. Your knees want to be just above your ankles. Everything's nice and tight in your core. Give me a couple of more. Let's do one more. And go ahead and sit down. Start stomping your feet, just a nice walk. For those of you who are standing, do your best here. So walk in place. You can move your arms if you want, you don't have to. Smile, sit up nice and tall, shoulders down, abdominals in. I've taught group fitness classes for a long time, so I'm very comfortable with this stuff. Now go a little faster with those feet. This reminds me of you, uh, a stadium, right, on Saturday? In the, the South End bleachers. A little faster with those feet, come on. Get them moving. This gets your blood flowing, get the oxygen going around. Also boost up your metabolism because you're burning some calories as fast as you can go. We're gonna do two stretches after this. This sounds so good. I love it. Number four, sit up. You can always work more than one muscle group. All right, good, stop. Right foot out in front, stretch out that leg, flex the foot. I wish I could show you my foot, but flex it. I want you to just slightly bend forward. <coughs> Do not go to the point where it hurts. You just want some tension. What muscle are we stretching back here? Hamstring. Hamstring muscle. 
80% of us suffer from lower back problems. One of those reasons is because of tight hamstrings. You could do this in your chair in your office. Your coworkers might think you're a little nuts, but go ahead and switch to the other side. Now, ideally, we want to hold a stretch for about 30 seconds, but I only have two minutes with you, so I'm, I think you guys can handle the shortened, if the abbreviated stretch. Again, be very careful not to, to overstretch. You don't want any pain. The last stretch we're going to do, hands behind you, behind the chair if you have to, and stretch out that chest. So I want your chest almost pointing up towards the ceiling. We sit like this, don't we? Hunched over. As much as you can stretch out those chest muscles throughout the day. Every 30 minutes, do some stretches in your chair. It gets that oxygen flowing. It gets you more alert. It'll get you engaged. It refers back to that energy management that Fern was talking about. And release. You're done. Thank you all very much. Hi, I'm Kathleen McCutcheon, uh, Chief Human Resources Officer here at uh, OSU. Thank you. And uh, first of all, how many of us have taken the PHA? Show of hands. Yes. Biometric screening. Yes. Okay. Completed our activities. Yes. Oh, great. Okay, so this is a good representative sample. Not really, but yes, we're getting there. <laughs> Soon it will be, right? Um, great. It's, uh, it's great to be here and talk about wellness. I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about what we've been doing in terms of um, our offerings for our faculty and staff here at OSU. Okay, um, and, uh, and talk a little bit about the progress that we've made because we have made progress. And so that's one of the things that I really want everybody to understand and to celebrate and to really continue because the room, you know, had great participation to be ambassadors for across the university. Um, this chart shows us that overall employees, and this is a Gallup poll, Gallup um, has a incredible series of um, surveys around well-being and dealing with different facets of well-being. And we all know that for employees that feel that they have better well-being or higher well-being or <laughs> optimal well-being, um, their attention at work increases their focus on what they're doing increases, their productivity increases. So it all makes good business sense, right? But the other thing is it's the right thing to do in terms of being an employer to provide the opportunities for people to reach their optimum wellness. So one of the things that, you know, we look at the slide and say, wow, what a downer. Only 8% strongly agree with my employer really gives me the opportunity to increase my optimal well-being and wellness. Um, but positive news is that I believe here at Ohio State we have a very different story to tell and our story centers around the opportunities that we have and that our our institution offers us in terms of really achieving that optimal health well-being and really thriving in a very different way than many organizations are offering today uh, some of the things and I think you're probably all very familiar with them uh, that we offer in addition to and this is going to be corny, the symphony of benefits um, that we have. And really, we're, we are coordinating them. So these are not just random things put together, uh, are, are some of the things that I think you all have taken advantage of. And we would like more individuals across the university to continue to take advantage of. And not just people who are employees here, so not just our faculty and staff, but also their covered dependents, so their families, their spouses, their partners. And that really increases the power of what we have to offer here. Um, some of the things that I, I think are really very interesting, and Byrne talked about some of these statistics, and I think very positive in terms of our direction, is that um, as of the end of uh, last month, which our big push was for people to sign up and take their PHA, our participation rate is at 68%. That comes a long way from the 19% when we started this effort in 2006. So uh, incredible movement in terms of people recognizing that it's important to do. And of course, you get the $360 a year if you do it, which is also nice. Um, we are looking at a 30% participation rate in terms of spouses 
and same-sex domestic partners. And we really want to continue to increase that participation rate on both the employee side and the spouse and partner side and the dependent side as well. Um, our incentive programs, 44% um, of our faculty and staff in 2011 participated. One of the biggest numbers here is that we have paid back, in terms of our incentive programs, $6 million to our faculty and staff in terms of participation. Um, and that's in the five years since the plan's been in place. So we love doing that, right? Um, in terms of personal health coaching in 2011, uh, we had 1,300 individuals that participated in that personal health coaching. It's a great program. I have gotten incredible reviews from people who have participated in the program, but we'd like more people to participate. In terms of care coordination, 3,000 individuals in 2011 participated. These are for individuals who have chronic conditions, um, who are really working and looking for a, more, uh, a better way to optimize their health with the conditions that they, they have. Um, the other thing that I think is remarkable, and we've been trying to get at this, um, but it takes time because our, it takes time for our data really to work out for us, and it, and it really is, and this is the first bit of evidence, is that for those that participate in taking the PHA, um, we are starting to see lower rates in terms of the cost and in terms of what the indiv individuals are paying as well. So at about the 18-month mark you see here, Individuals in blue that don't participate in the PHA, that are kind of the baseline, and in green that do participate in taking the PHA, they're taking more advantages of the services that we have to offer, and over time their cost is going down. What I'd love to be able to tell you is that they're healthier. That's what we don't know yet. That's what the correlation that we're looking for, and that's what we're going to continue to work on. But most important for us is to continue to keep people engaged, to have people aware that we have these opportunities and that they have these opportunities not only for themselves but for their covered dependents and continue to make this a healthier place for all of us to work. One of the things that we focused on for this year, which I think is very exciting, um, probably the most exciting thing of all the exciting things I'm telling you about, um, is that our PCP, so primary care physician cost, will be zero for this coming year. So when you visit your primary care physician, there is no copay, there is no coinsurance. And why are we doing this? We're doing this so that we can start the relationship with an individual doctor who understands you, who understands your medical history, your medical conditions, and where you want to be, what your plan for health is um, early. Um, we want to continue that relationship going forward, and we really want to get people connected with that individual so that we can help them optimize their health as well as their primary care physician can help them. This is very exciting. Um, we're coming out soon with all of our information. Carrie, it goes into... Okay, will be mailed to your homes the beginning of next week, uh, along with our rate chart, um, which is a good story to tell as well. So once again, some very exciting um, news and some very exciting opportunities in terms of us all being a healthier population. So uh, what else is new? Uh, I think everybody knows that as of the end of September, um, we took down the portal uh, to take your PHA. And, you know, I think everyone knows why, but the reason is that we have something new and better coming in its place. Uh, the new portal will, be, portal will be up the beginning of this coming year, so 2013. Um, it is improved. It's much more fun. It includes gamification. So for people that p play video games or maybe don't play video games, it's going to be a lot more fun. Uh, it's not going to be a boring list to go through. Uh, you're going to have the ability to have individual challenges. So, hey, I really want to get to this goal in terms of my health and well-being. I can set up a challenge for myself. I can set up a challenge for colleagues, friends, other people, um, perhaps even other organizations, perhaps units, um, competing in a, in a fun and positive, healthy way against uh, each other to get um, in, in better uh, health and in better shape. So we've got all kinds of interesting things coming. This is probably, I think, um, one of the game changers for us in terms of getting people more involved. And we're looking just in terms of um, generationally getting people that are younger that may not be thinking so much of, gosh, you know, when I'm 10 years older or 20 years older, 
you know, if I do these things, I can potentially avoid some of these things happening. So once again, very exciting. My pleasure to tell you about these things, but, but continue to stay involved personally. That's my challenge to you. Um, and as Bern always says, you know, one thing. So if the one thing is taking your PHA, do it. If it's going on to the next step in terms of biometric screening, do it. If it's getting a health coach or care coordination, please do it. And, but ultimately, get in there and see a, a, a PCP, have a relationship with a provider. Um, it's important to you, it's important to your families, and it's important to us as a, as a university and a community. Thanks. Larry? I'll, be, I'll, I'll sort of shop out of my comments, but before I do, I just want to comment, uh, looking at the room, I know that women are often sort of early leaders in positive areas like health care and health, health promotion, but look at this room. I'm proud of the men that did show up. Thank you. Thank you, men. This is, this is definitely woman power here today, but it's, it's, um, we're hoping that you'll recruit some of your male colleagues and, and, uh, and the friends as well into the future. But I just want to say how, what an important time this is for the university to have a collection of leaders like we have right now with Byrne, who's joined us with her national prominence in health and wellness. With, um, we've got, um, uh, people who are role models uh, for health and wellness. President Gee, who works out every morning, as you know, and manages his energy and nutrition very carefully. And we've got uh, Mike Caligiri here, who's the CEO of our cancer system, who's the godparent of Pelotonia and has inspired so many of us. I mean, his inspiration is not just, you know, treating and, and trying to cure cancer, but to eliminate it. And his inspiration is to get us all more active and to get us more inspired to be active and be on a bicycle and be be out there for a cause, right, Mike? And so, absolutely, he says. And so this is just a very important time, and to have Kathleen McCutcheon as the Chief Human Resources Officer thinking about health and well-being of all of us, not just physical health, but as Byrne says, as Kathleen talks about, to have, to have leaders focused on our, our happiness, our positive focus, our well-being is very important. So this is great. So I just want to say that what's going to be important as we move forward is not only changing our environment, which is going to be up to some of us, our physical environment, our office environment, our nutrition environment, we're going to need to do some of that, but we need all of you to get engaged and help move this forward. Don't wait on us. Don't wait on the environment to change. We need to work on that, yes. There's things we need to do, but it just takes one person at a time to sort of reach out and grab a colleague, inspire somebody else. You know adopt a healthy habit, become public with it, share it with others. That's the way a culture of health gets created. It's not always just programs. It's very important. So I'll just add some ideas to what um, Byrne talked about and then close. One is trying to try to get 30 more minutes of sleep if you can. Just 30 more minutes would, would help. Find 15 minutes a day, especially right before you go to bed. Byrne talked about reading 10 minutes in the morning. I read 15 minutes of worthless fiction at night before I go to bed. And it's it relaxes me beautifully. Just find that 15 minutes. If your work is primarily sitting, as she talked about, try to find a way to stand more. Have standing meetings. It seems like we have a Midwestern sort of, um, I don't know, hesitance around that. Steve Pariser and I stood when Byrne mentioned that. Nobody else did. I know you don't want to be standing in front of your colleagues, but yet there's, there's a hesitancy to do that sort of thing here. Be brave. Lead. Stand. Move. Walk. Eat smaller portions more often. Spend your lunch hour, spend your break walking, live at the top of the accountability ladder, focus on what's possible to do, not what's not possible. And so I would just say, don't wait on us, start living and leading with us. Thank you. Let's take...